Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the second talk of this uh, morning session. Our speaker uh, is going to be Alexander Bakos, who works at the platinum level Pi Data sponsor Dexter Energy. Um, Yay. <laughs> and um, he will try to convince us to use probabilistic instead of deterministic forecasts, at least when trying to predict renewable energy generation. And yesterday I was at um, the booth uh, from Dexter Energy, and as some of you may know, there's a similar talk going on right now in the bar room, but the fine folks at Dexter uh, told me that this talk is way more interesting, so I'm... <laughs> Uh, I can reassure you that you uh, made the right decision in coming here. So, a uh, big round of applause for, for Alexander Bakos, please. All right. Hey, welcome. Thanks for coming. My name is Alexander Bakos. I'm a data science manager at Dexter Energy. I'll tell more about Dexter Energy in a moment, but we'll, in this talk, we'll be diving into energy time series forecasting and then specifically probabilistic forecasting. But well, before we do that, we'll first need to understand a bit more about energy markets and why we need forecasts in the first place. And this story, this story starts with climate change. So one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge of our time. Global warming has led to an increase in extreme weather events, natural disasters, and the rising sea levels. They pose an existential threat to humans across the globe endangering the Earth's entire ecosystem. And the main driver of climate change is the vast amount of emissions of greenhouse gases we've put into the atmosphere over the past century. The energy sector accounts for over 73% of these emissions. And of these 73%, a significant proportion is from fossil fueled powered thermal plants that provide electricity. And also, a large proportion of that, that 73% can be replaced with more renewable sources. And therefore, to mitigate climate change, one important strategy that we have is to transition to a renewable energy supply. And this is not only an important strategy in the battle against climate change, it is also an enabler for our sustainable growth of our ever-increasing needs for energy. And in the recent years, we have seen an accelerated, increased introduction of, introduction of renewables into the grid. But this comes with a, a big challenge. And this challenge is about balance in the grid. So the energy grid needs to stay in balance at any moment in time. Supply needs to equal the demand. The energy, amount of energy going into the system into the grid needs to be the same as the energy that's consumed. And uh, if this doesn't happen, you get a drop in the frequency of the system. And only a small drop in the frequency or rise just of a quarter percent off, this can already make devices break. And ultimately, this can lead to a blackout. So why is this a problem again? Well, with the renewables, keeping this supply stable is not so easy. So here you see actual wind and solar power generation across a span of four days. On the y-axis you see the megawatt hours and on the x-axis you see the time in days. And what you see here is that the supply of these renewable energy sources is intermittent and also to a large degree non-steerable. So it happens, it comes when it happens, when the wind blows, when the sun shines. This means that you have, we have to transition from a more demand-driven system to supply-driven system. So demand-driven it was because fossil fuel-powered thermal plants, they can spin up when the demand is high, but now we are supply-driven. We need to adapt to this generation pattern. Because demand is usually not that flexible. And we want to allow scheduling of this demand, of the consumption, to match the production. And a renewable energy supplier like here, this plate, needs to tell in advance what they think they'll produce, what they'll generate. And this all happens on the energy markets. So this brings me to energy markets. On these markets, participants can buy and sell energy. And there are many of these markets, advanced markets, uh, but I'll focus on the day ahead. You see here a timeline, T minus one, one day in advance at noon, 
renewable energy suppliers, but energy suppliers of any kind, need to say what kind of power volume they think they'll generate. And then there's T0, which is time of delivery. Then whenever you sell there, it needs to be delivered at that time point. And we'll see in a moment what happens if you cannot deliver at that time point. So here you see the day ahead market at T minus one. Say that our hypothetical renewable energy supplier sold a volume of 200 megawatt hours for a certain point in the, ne in the next day. And this price that the supplier gets for that is 90 euros. If they would sell a bit less, so instead of 200, we go to 100, then the supply decreases, and then the, the, the price increases. So the good becomes more scarce, the price increases. And this is basically the idea of that the energy market tries to match supply and demand mediated by the price. So dynamically setting the price to match supply and demand. And now this brings me to what happens when we sold the wrong quantity on the day ahead market. So let's, in this example, say that we have actually only generated 80 megawatt hours while we sold 100. Well, this actually means we're 20 megawatt hours short. So we have to basically buy that back on the time of delivery on the balancing market. We buy back that energy for 300 euros a megawatt hour. Why is this again so high? Now, in the, because everybody has the same problem. Everybody might have under forecasted and under predicted. And so everybody's short. There's a general shortage on the grid. So the price on the balancing market goes up. A negative imbalance. The system is short. And then there's these imbalance costs that our hypothetical renewable energy supplier incurs. These are the difference in power multiplied by the difference in price. So if we take this example, and that's a penalty you get for basically destabilizing the grid. You can see, view it like that. So if we plug the numbers into our example, we get a difference of 20 megawatt hours that we have short, and the difference of 200 euros per megawatt hours in the difference between these two markets that they had in the balancing market. We get a penalty, an imbalance cost, of 4,000 euros for this, only this instant. And this money is going to someone else, usually a fossil fuel power thermal plant, that actually is going to compensate for this shortage. And they get a reward of 4,000 euros for helping balance the grid. And you can imagine that this is particularly a problem for the renewable energy supplier, because they have this unpredictable, hard to predict, intermittent supply. And the money from sustainable energy sources is going to unsustainable sources. And this brings me to introducing Dexter Energy. So what we do is we provide short-term power forecasts and trade optimization for renewable portfolios. And therefore, we make renewable energy more predictable and therefore more profitable. We're scale up, we're founded in 2016, based in Amsterdam, and we have around 55 people working at Dexter, and we're growing fast. So this is Dexter. Let's now talk about the forecast we give, and also related to our example. Recall the formula for imbalance cost. So, there are two key unknown quantities, volume and price. And the supplier can leverage power forecast and price forecast to get an optimal trading strategy, so recommended trade in this picture here. And let's focus now a bit more on price. And this price forecast captures actually the uncertainty that is in the system. We can now going to zoom into how price forecast can help balance the grid. So this is our example from previous, from earlier. And we now have added forecasts. So let's assume for the illustrative purposes that these forecasts are accurate. Now the question is, so we forecast that we will only predict, uh, we only produce 80, we only generate 80 megawatt hours. And we also have price forecasts. Now knowing this, and knowing what kind of imbalance costs we can incur, what should we sell on this day ahead market? What kind of volume? So, I have four options. We sell as much as we can, we sell nothing, zero, or we sell a bit more or a bit less. Show of hands, who thinks we should sell as much as we can? Nobody? Who should think we should sell nothing? Yeah, I see a couple of hands. Yeah, this is an interesting, I'll get back to that. We should, we, who thinks we should sell a little bit more? A little bit more, and a bit less. Who thinks we should sell a bit less? I see a lot of hands now. 
that's good. That's, that's correct. That's the correct answer. So, and I will get to why B is not the correct answer in a moment, because that's pretty interesting in itself. So we sell a bit less, like five megawatt hours less. Then we're the ones actually having this kind of surplus at the time of delivery, and we can help balance the grid. And also, because of this price dynamic, price elasticity, we actually lowered the delta price a bit. There's less grid imbalance. And we, for that, get a reward of 5 times 100 euro, euros per megawatt hour. So 500 euros, yeah, reward, you could say. And why are we not going to hold everything back, so go to zero? Well, there's two main reasons for that that I want to highlight now. So the first one is that there's a so-called price maker effect. So if we go down a lot, we also kind of change this price difference a lot and we might flip the market into a surplus state because we have all this leftover 80 megawatt hours, then there's like, hey, there's a surplus on the grid, and we flipped it. And that basically means that we, again, incur a big penalty, actually a very big one, for flipping the market. So this is not good either. And the second reason is that you might want to steer on your own risk appetite. So how much financial risk are you willing to take in a situation? And that also brings you to not trading, going all in, but trading a little bit less. Let me explain this. So here you see a point forecast. So basically a time series of the price, some actuals, and then a T minus one, we want to predict the next time series, the course of that, so a forecast. But we need to harness the uncertainty in the system, learn to embrace it. We forecast percentiles or quantiles, so basically many different prediction intervals for each time point in the future. And so we get a probability distribution at each time point in the future. So let me explain that with a following outline. So if we take a slice here, we basically see that there's a, a, a probability density function, as it's called, on each slice. So you have the price on the x-axis, and then you see the amount of probability mass on the y-axis. So in this case, we get a probability for each possible future. And if we then look at this uh, probability density function, we see a Q80. That means that 80% of the observations will lie below. So we can use this number to sort of steer on risk. How? Because if we see this picture, we know we can probably expect a positive price. But if I now show you this one, there's an interesting bimodal distribution here with a, a, a small but significant probability that we'll have a negative price instead. So you might want to do something completely different depending on what kind of power you expect to generate or what kind of financial risks you're willing to take, how much you weigh loss over gains. How do we get this probabilistic forecast? Basically, we can view it as a time series regression problem where we take some models, some forecasting models, it can be a machine learning model, and we feed it input features from the market, prices, grid data, some autoregressive features we can build upon that, and very importantly, weather data. What kind of weather is it going to be? Cloud coverage, sunshine, temperature, wind speeds, this kind of stuff. And then, remember this price maker effect that I talk about? You also should actually include your own trading actions in this model. It makes some sort of causal model that tries to predict the price given what you will do on the market. This topic is, however, going very much into the secret sauce of Dexter and outside the scope of the talk, so I will focus on leaving this out and taking a so-called price taker assumption, so that we don't affect the price, but we, we model it such that we don't affect the price, which is not true in reality. So how do we get this model to output a probabilistic forecast, so a probability density function? As always, we should start simple with a baseline model. So we can take our point forecasting model that we already have and get the residuals on a calibration data set. So we hold out some data and there we compute our residuals. Then we get an error distribution. And then for a new data point, we take the prediction from our point forecast model and just simply overlay that using the point forecast as a mean for the distribution. This is a very simple baseline model that already has a couple of nice properties and that is it is distribution free. It can assume any distribution non-parametrically that the data has. It also guarantees that your quantiles are correct.
but it also has a disadvantage, which is that it's the same for every, it's the same for every point that you predict. So there's no variation. And maybe this is a good time to discuss on what defines a good probabilistic forecast. So there's two main concepts I want to cover here. The first one is calibration. The second one is sharpness. Calibration is about if we take the, 20, the Q20, so the 20th quantile, are also 20% of the observations in some new test set below that quantile. So if you, for that, you can plot, uh, make a QQ plot, quantile quantile plot, where you put the theoretical quantile on the x axis, that's the quantile we want to, to actually predict, against the sampled quantile, that's the quantile you get from the data on some sort of calibration data set or whole validation data set. And the perfectly calibrated model follows the diagonal. Uh, so the Q20 would be a point on Q20. But here's a, a model that's not so well calibrated. So actually at Q20, it's more actually more in the neighborhood of the Q40. And this is what we call coverage error. So this is not good. You want to sort of get a straight line there. But the model can be perfectly calibrated, but still not give you a lot of predictive information. And this baseline approach this can be very br with very broad uncertainty for each point. So therefore, you also want to look at the sharpness. Basically, this is our probability distribution function again, and this kind of PDF gives us a different picture than this kind of PDF. Yeah, so that's the sharpness. And I will now present a metric that can cover both, which is continuous rank probability score. And we have our PDF here on the screen. We convert that to cumulative distribution function. So we basically take the cumulative sum. So it goes from 0 to 1. Uh, so this transformation is pretty important. And then we basically take the area that's between the actual, so the actual is a point on the, uh, the uh, x-axis, basically. We take this area that is shaded here in red, and that is our continuous rank probability score. And in the formula, we use this heavy side step function to indicate in which side of the actual you are, in which area you need to sum. And the nice property of CRPS is, all, is that it captures not only calibration and sharpness in one go, but also it has interpretability. Because it's a generalization of the mean absolute error. So if now I just take our point forecast here, plot in a dotted line in both the PDF and the CDF, then we see that it's basically a step function. And if we then take that area, that red shaded area, according to the formula, the CRPS is equal to the mean absolute error. So if we say we're 10 euros off with CRPS, then we know this probabilistic forecast is on average 10 euros off. That's pretty handy. And now back to our probabilistic forecasting method, because we call our baseline method gave the same result for every same uncertainty interval for every, um, every observation. I will now outline three methods to obtain conditional uncertainty estimates. And they all boil down to quantile regression. Uh, and this is important because uncertainty is not always the same. If it's a sunny day, you might have a different uncertainty profile than when it's a cloudy day. And this is called heteroscedicity in statistical terms. So the variance is not the same. I will now yeah, go into these three approaches, quantile loss, quantile forest, and a quantile binning approach. The first one, quantile loss, is basically to asymmetrically weigh the errors of our model during the training. So here you see a loss function. This is basically the error on the x-axis and the weight of that error on the y-axis. So in the mean absolute error or L1 loss, we basically have a weight which is identical to the error. So it's symmetrical. And we don't over-penalize, over-forecast or under-forecast. If we now want to estimate, for instance, the Q20, the 20th quantile, we actually are going to overweigh under-forecasting. And therefore, the model will overemphasize the lower part of the... Uh, so try to sort of in general, get a, predict a lower value than the median. And this is also called pinball loss. Why? Because it kind of resembles the movement of a pinball ball. You can extend a, a model like LightGBM regressor using this quantile loss. You say the objective is quantile, you indicate alpha, which is the slope of the red lines. And then you can have your point here on your probability distribution density function. And then if you take the last example, for instance, want to estimate the Q30 or Q80, we flip it around. We overweigh over forecast. And by doing that a lot of time, repeating this for different quantiles, we can get the full distribution function. 
Second approach it has a theoretical connection with quanta loss, but the way to get there is different. It's to aggregate ensemble predictions. We start with a random forest here, where we take the training data and we take bootstrap samples. And from these bootstrap samples, we, kind of, we make decision trees. And if we fully grow these trees with having one sample per leaf, we basically can, with a test data point, we can just take these individual predictions and create a histogram or a density function from that. And this is, this is also a pretty neat tri trick. Um, but in practice, you might not want to fully grow your trees to prevent overfitting. You might have samples with the same target value in one leaf, so a bunch of problems. So you want to make sure, if you implement this, that you, for instance, store training samples in each leaf or create histograms and weigh them properly. But this is the basic concept. Now for the last quantile regression approach. It's again the same idea, but a different method. It's, it's to reduce, so a reduction, of the quantile regression problem to a classification problem. How does this work? Well, first we bin our target, so our price that we want to predict, into intervals. So we say, does the price lie between 0 and 10, between 10 and 20, between 20 and 30, for each sample in our training data? We encode it in a one-hot encoding, as I've done here on the screen. And then we train a model. This can be any multi-class classifier that's, uh, where, of which the probability is sum to one. So one trick is you can wrap any classifier in one versus rest and then from scikit-learn, and then you can basically use anything you want. Then at the prediction time, you simply take the probabilities for each of these bins and construct a histogram and then a probability density function from that. So in the example here, you see that these probabilities they match up to the, um, yeah, to, the histo to the histogram. Disadvantage of this method is that it can produce very noisy PDFs, in particular when there is areas in the feature space where there is a low amount of samples. This is a common problem. And it is, remains key to really assess the quality of your probabilistic forecast in a rigorous way. So, one of the last topics I want to touch upon is that a big problem of all the approach that we discussed is that although in theory they should give a well-calibrated prediction, they, in practice they don't. There's all kinds of reasons, overfitting, and noise in the data. And we would actually like to have these theoretical guarantees, so that if we take, for instance, the 40th quantile, that only 40% of the observations lies below that, and not more, not less. If we don't have that well-calibration, right calibration, we might make a wrong trade decision, and then destabilize the grid. So that's not what we want. And one framework that has in gained increased in popularity is conformal prediction. And I will now outline what that is. In the basic form, we can apply it to our quantile regression as an ad hoc post-processing. We take our quantile regression model. For instance, for the Q40, we have a model trained with quantile loss. This is our quantile 40, 40 quantile model. And then on a calibration data set, again, we hold this out, we don't train on that. We predict, make predictions. And again, we extract the error distributions, and then we look where is our sample quantile and what is the actual quantile in the error distribution. So in this case, you see that the sample quantiles, so the, error, the number of, of observations with a lower value are around 20%. This is not good. So we want to shift it a bit to the... Um, to the right, <laughs> and um, uh, that's the correction factor. And we basically add this correction factor to the original quantile prediction to ensure coverage. And this gives us well-calibrated uh, predictions with mild assumptions. So again, distribution-free. There's one critical assumption, though, which is the exchangeability assumption. Is that, and that's tricky with time series because, yeah, you if you have a non-stationary time series. The, um, the samples are not independent and identically distributed random variables, so you want to make sure that you would do it some sort of a rolling window kind of fashion. There's a, a package, uh, it's called MAPI, that, that has this kind of logic implemented. It's an, an area of active research. research. Um, I invite you to, um, to check out the, the resources and uh, learn more about it, it's very exciting. Okay, this brings me to the last point, is that we talked about the price forecasting, but how do we combine it with power forecasting? Well, this can also be a probabilistic forecast. So you have two probability distributions for any prediction. 
You can plug that into an optimization engine. This can be in the simplest form a Monte Carlo simulation, where you compute for each sample that you draw, and then you combine them. You compute the cost using the formula we, we actually explain. And this is a very simple approach. Uh, there are more intricacies to this problem than I can explain in the, in the, in the time that I have here. Uh, and there's also different approaches here. I really recommend the work of uh, Pierre Pinson here, referenced in the, in the corner of the slide, if you're interested in learning more about this topic. This brings me to the key takeaways from this talk. First, I hope I've shown you how probabilistic forecasting can add value by enabling risk-based energy trading. So based on your risk appetite, your loss versus gains, you can make different decisions and help stabilize the grid. How existing machine learning models can be extended to estimate quantiles, shown three, four, three approaches plus a baseline approach. And finally, lastly, I hope to have shown that probabilistic forecasting can help accelerate the energy transition to renewable energy sources. And with that, I'd like to end. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions. <laughs>